Welcome to the Coolidge Way. We've spoken a great deal about Calvin Coolidge's era and his views on the issues of his day, and even wondered what Coolidge might think about contemporary public policy issues. But today we'll go back into Coolidge's own background and the surprising path that led a boy from rural Vermont to the White House. I'm Jim Douglas, four-term governor of Vermont and big fan of our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge was a thoughtful man. Taking his perspective on governmental do's and don'ts, we'll evaluate today's important challenges. And we'll always ask, what would Coolidge do? This is The Coolidge Way, proudly presented by the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Let's take a walk in a small village cemetery in the hills of Vermont. Close to the road, there's a row of gravestones made from the granite quarries of Barry, each stone more or less the same height. Only when you examine one of them do you see the presidential seal cut into the rock. This is the grave of an American president, yet so modest the eye might not even spot it among the others. This is the grave of Calvin Coolidge, no mighty marble planks, no mausoleum for Coolidge. All men, the grave seems to say, are equal when it comes to the important matters in life and death. We describe Coolidge's grave in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, because it helps to show where our 30th president acquired the values he prized, religious faith, personal modesty, federalism, and rigorous government restraint. Plymouth today is a town of fewer than a thousand, small as in Coolidge's day. Yet Plymouth is a place of extraordinary beauty, to which not only Americans but foreigners come, sometimes by the busload, just to catch the glittering autumn leaves in the Green Mountains. The late scholar Hendrik Borum noted that Plymouth Notch was in a bowl, surrounded by spruce and pine foliage. In this way, the village feels like an amphitheater, with the town citizens as players on the center stage and the waving pines the spectators watching from afar. The Coolidges came here by way of Boston, and before that, Cottenham, England. Coolidge ancestor Calvin Coolidge made his way on the Revolutionary Road and established five farms for his descendants. Tilling the soil was never easy there. It said that Vermonters farm rocks. Surveyors evaluating the presidential birthplace determined that scarcely an acre of the Plymouth soil was genuinely arable. Members of the Coolidge family, like so many Americans, headed west from Plymouth via canal in the 1800s to the more hospitable plains of Minnesota and Wisconsin. But John Coolidge, Calvin's father, remained. These Coolidges were the ones who stayed. The president's father and grandfather made staying a point of pride. Coolidge's grandfather even gave him a few acres, known as the lime kiln lot, to tie me to the land, as Coolidge later recalled. Although Calvin Coolidge's own life took him down the Connecticut River Valley for college and a career, he maintained his family's dedication to the Notch, as it's known colloquially, throughout his life. But what was it about Plymouth that made Coolidge the determined man he was? For one thing, the villagers respected one another and worked together. In town meetings above the store in the center of town, where Coolidge sold apples or popcorn, he saw that party didn't matter and discourse was polite. The people of Plymouth were not all poor, but being farmers, they didn't always have much cash. From the spring work of collecting sap from trees for their sugar, maple sugar, through the summer of haying, to the slaughter of the animals so they would have something to eat come the dark winter, everyone in Plymouth was always busy. The railroad network spread over America in the 1800s, though the railroad did not come up the steep hill to Plymouth. But the Coolidges and the other residents made their life work. It was a tough, hearty community. Here's Coolidge living history performer Tracy Messer quoting from the president's autobiography about the Notch. It was a hard but wholesome life under which the people suffered many privations and enjoyed many advantages without any clear realization of the existence of either one of them. John Calvin Coolidge Jr., our future president, was born into that community on July 4th. 1872. He's the only president born on the 4th of July, and Plymouth really was a classic American village, something like what Alexei de Tocqueville described. 
Father Coolidge ran the country store in Plymouth. It was here that Coolidge saw how hard it was for people to always come up with the necessary cash. Referring to his father, Coolidge wrote, He trusted nearly everybody, but lost a surprisingly small amount. Sometimes people he had not seen for years would return and pay him the whole bill. Try to imagine farming without electricity and without vehicles. The Coolidges had trouble getting the milk from their cows to market in Boston. Coolidge's father, John, came up with a solution, cheese, which doesn't spoil as quickly, and he established a cheese cooperative. In fact, you can test the cheddar in the Plymouth Cheese Shop today when you visit the Notch. The trials of the small business were described by the president's father in a ditty that hangs at the cheese factory today. It reads, A poet I do not claim to be, so don't expect a rhyme from me. Earning the dollar was very plain prose, so every tinker in the town well knows. For earn it I did, what think you of that? Tinkering and soldering the cheese factory vat. Faith held it all together. Coolidge's grandmother, Sarah Almeida Coolidge, taught Sunday school. The Bible infused all the Coolidge's did, right down to the baking. Here's a biblical recipe from the Coolidge family papers in the Vermont Historical Society archive in Barrie. Each ingredient comes with a biblical source on the topic, a kind of pun by the bakers, probably Coolidge's grandmother, Mother Victoria, or aunts. For example, one cup of butter, Judges 5, 25. Three and a half cups flour, First Kings 4, 22. Two cups sugar, Jeremiah 6, 20, and so on. At the end it said, follow Solomon's advice for making good boys, Proverbs 23, 14, and you'll have good cake. Bake in a loaf and ice. Coolidge's formal education began in Plymouth also, in a one-room schoolhouse and continued at Black River Academy in nearby Ludlow. At the academy, Coolidge took classes in Greek and Roman literature, developing a passion for the classics he'd sustained for the rest of his life. Coolidge also had his first encounter with the U.S. Constitution around the time he started high school. Although I was but 13 years old, the subject interested me exceedingly. The study of it, which I then began, has never ceased. Young Coolidge read a lot, perhaps more, one imagines, after the untimely death of his mother when he was only 12. For college, Coolidge enrolled at Amherst College in Massachusetts. He was neither a stellar nor a poor student and made few friends at first. There, the country boy met classmates who would become lifelong friends and supporters. Dwight Morrow, for example, who would go on to be a partner at J.P. Morgan and Coolidge's ambassador to Mexico. Coolidge at first did not make it into a fraternity, though he wanted to. One consolation was that a fellow student he admired, a good debater from New York, actually rejected frat life. That undergrad debater was Harlan Stone, whom Coolidge later tapped for the United States Supreme Court. In his senior year, Coolidge did end up pledging Phi Beta Gamma, but his letters home suggest he was adrift. In a year-end survey that asked graduating seniors about their career plans, Coolidge's friend Dwight Morrow wrote, Law, while others wrote, Business, or simply, Undecided. Coolidge, of Plymouth, however, wrote, Nothing. In reality, the quiet young man was thinking through his plans. Coolidge ultimately chose to pursue the law in Massachusetts, opting to read law at the Hampshire County seat of Northampton, not far from Amherst, rather than attend law school. Well, we actually don't know if he opted or if his father, John, just found the newfangled law schools too expensive. The young man studied for the state bar by clerking and reading at night, as Abe Lincoln had done. Through an Amherst connection, Coolidge secured an opportunity to read law in the offices of John Hammond and Henry Field. Two years later, Coolidge passed the Massachusetts bar exam and soon after began his own law practice on Northampton's Main Street. Almost immediately, Coolidge began laying the groundwork for his career in politics, serving on the Republican City Committee and the Common Council of Northampton. By 1900, he successfully ran for city solicitor. During this period of Coolidge's life, he began to insist on being called Calvin, not John. 
The quiet young attorney passed the bar exam a year earlier than expected, and soon after he met a young woman who lived across the street, Grace Anna Goodhue. Actually, the extrovert Grace found Calvin. They struck up a friendship and bonded over a shared love of poetry. A bit more than a year later, they were married. Their first son, John, was born 11 months later, followed by Calvin Jr. in 1908. In that same span, Coolidge successfully ran for the Massachusetts House of Representatives and, after two terms, for mayor of Northampton. The young family prospered the Coolidge way, saving where they could. For linens, the Coolidges bought seconds, the remainders from a hotel in Northampton. Among the families Coolidge's firm represented was that of the poet Emily Dickinson. Even as Coolidge's political ambition grew, he remained humble, seeking to cultivate allies at every turn. I try to treat people as they treated me, Coolidge said of his early political life. That approach guided Coolidge through a two-decade rise from Northampton City Hall to the White House, though Coolidge didn't know it at the time. Looking back, he wrote, I did not plan for it, but it came. By my studies and my course of life, I meant to be ready to take advantage of opportunities. I was ready, from the time the justices named me the clerk of the courts until my party nominated me for president. His friend Dwight put it another way. The Coolidge rule was not to look for promotion, Dwight noted, but to do your current job so well that the promotion offers come unbidden. After two terms as mayor, Coolidge sought to return to legislative office and was elected to the Massachusetts Senate. By 1914, he was chosen president of the Senate. It was on the occasion of taking that office that Coolidge gave his classic speech that students often recite at the Coolidge Foundation, entitled Have Faith in Massachusetts. Few documents spell out Coolidge's philosophy more clearly. Government cannot relieve from toil. It can provide no substitute for the rewards of service. It can, of course, care for the defective and recognize distinguished merit. The normal must take care for themselves. Self-government means self-support. Man is born into the universe with a personality that is his own. He has a right that is founded upon the constitution of the universe to have property that is his own. Ultimately, property rights and personal rights are the same thing. The one cannot be preserved if the other be violated. Each man is entitled to his rights and the rewards of his service, be they never so large or never so small. Coolidge taught others through his speeches, but his speeches also taught him. As he put it, I felt at the time that the speeches I made and the statements I issued had a clearness of thought and revealed a power I had not been able to express, which confirmed my belief that when a duty comes to us, with it a power comes to enable us to perform it. Coolidge was serving as a legislator during the rise of the progressive movement. The young lawmakers supported progress, but eventually found the volume of laws the new progressives passed off-putting. While young Cal was in Massachusetts politics, His father was serving Vermont as a state lawmaker in Montpelier. Coolidge wrote Dad some advice. It's better to kill a bad law, he said, than pass a good one. Coolidge won nearly every election in which he ran. By the age of 46, he was governor of Massachusetts. As author John Blair shows in his dissertation, a legislator from western Massachusetts was particularly good at wooing and winning the immigrant vote. Coolidge triumphed narrowly after a long and difficult campaign and believed that this would be his last political foray. The freshman governor was about to be thrust into the national spotlight. In 1919, inflation drove prices up, but there were no cost-of-living adjustments. Civil servants' pay did not rise. The city's police contract said, no strikes. With strikes and revolutions occurring the world over, the Boston patrolmen decided that it was their turn to fight back. Shortly after Labor Day, three-quarters of the police force left their posts. Today, we worry about violence in cities. The new governor confronted similar chaos 
including looting and property destruction in downtown Boston. Governor Coolidge mobilized the Massachusetts State Guard to quell the unrest. What should Coolidge do about the police? The police were by and large good, hard-working men. Their police horses whinnied after their old friends when they saw their officers without uniforms wandering the street. But the policemen had violated their contract. Coolidge paused for a few long days, then backed up the police commissioner who fired the men. To explain, the governor wrote a line that would reverberate down the decades. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. Coolidge's terse rebuke of the striking officers made an important point. Public servants who put their own pay or concerns before the public itself are betraying society. But Coolidge's move was incredibly risky. Coolidge himself didn't know whether his career was finished. The policemen were popular, and they were indeed, as they contended, underpaid. In those days, the Massachusetts gubernatorial term was only one year long. Maybe he would, as he wrote his father John, lose his next election only months away. That's not what happened, though. Coolidge did win the next gubernatorial election, and his insight caught the nation's attention, including that of the sitting president, Woodrow Wilson, who also turned against such disruptive strikes. Other presidents later recalled Coolidge's move, including President Ronald Reagan, who made an equally controversial decision when he fired striking air traffic controllers in the early 1980s. The police action by Coolidge catapulted the Bay State governor to the national stage and into the second spot on the 1920 Republican presidential ticket. In part two, we'll cover Coolidge's journey from Boston to Washington, D.C., and eventually to the White House. Before we bring in our guest for today's episode, it's time for our Calvin Coolidge pop quiz. Here's the question. When a president passes away, as Coolidge's predecessor, Warren Harding, did, the vice president assumes the presidency. How many times have vice presidents become president after a death in American history? Well, think that over, and we'll have the answer at the end of the episode. I also want to take a moment to let you know how you can get in touch with us. Send us your thoughts on this episode at CoolidgeFoundation.org slash The Coolidge Way or by visiting our social pages on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to see your comments and any ideas you have for future topics. As you can see, Coolidge's success was intimately tied to his abilities as a writer and orator. That's why our guest is Craig Fairman, a leading scholar of presidential writing. Craig is the author of Author-in-Chief, the untold story of our presidents and the books they wrote, as well as the compilation The Best Presidential Writing from 1789 to the Present. He's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Craig graduated from the University of Southern Indiana, and worked on a Ph.D. at Yale University, which, of course, was a place inhabited by a number of our presidents through the years. He now lives in Bloomington, Indiana. Well, Craig Fairman, thanks so much for joining us on The Coolidge Way. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, in your book, which I really enjoyed reading, you're a real fan of Calvin Coolidge. Tell us why. Well, I, I just think that he's a wonderful writer. You mentioned that anthology, Best Presidential Writing, and, and I included three texts from Coolidge, and, I, and I, the hard part was choosing which ones to include, not finding things that, that lived up to that idea of the best. He was such a good writer, and it was something that was appreciated even in his own time. You know, Today we think of him as silent Cal, but when he was president, the New York Times political correspondent wrote a story saying this: the White House has its most literary occupants since Abraham Lincoln. And so his writing was important to his political rise and to how he wielded political power. But I also just think it, it, it was a unique way to understand him as a person. And when you look at presidents as writers, you can kind of see that personal side. And I really think that Coolidge, Coolidge can sometimes be a difficult person to understand. That's why podcasts like this one are so important. And use, looking at him as a writer is a great way to gain insight into a, a very fascinating mind. You mentioned his scholarship, and in, in his autobiography, he talks about the courses he took and the professors who mentored him at Amherst College. 
and he was uh, quite religious. Um, and uh, I wonder if you sense in any of his writing um, an, an influence by that scholarship, perhaps the classics in particular, and also his um, a devotion to his faith and the King James Bible in particular. Sure. Well, I, I definitely could sense both of those traditions, and part of it is because the, the, those traditions were so inescapable at that time. You can see that Coolidge was very effective at using rhetorical devices like, you know, anaphora and other other devices taken from the classical tradition. But even more, I think there's the kind of the simplicity and, and the confidence that you would find in, in sermons and in the King James Bible. And, you know, that's, that stuff was everywhere. That stuff was the air you breathe. Before Amherst, when Coolidge graduated um, from Black River Academy, you know, one of his first attempts at public speaking was he did an oration at history at his graduation. But before he even got to do that, a prominent local minister stepped up and, and gave a sermon to mark the graduation and that day's events. The same thing happened when he graduated from Amherst. So even at educational events, you know, a sermon was still an essential building block to the program because that kind of stuff was everywhere. And so you can see that even in, in Coolidge's influences. He read widely as a boy and really cared about literature. One of my favorite things that he that he ever wrote was a, as an essay called, on books of my boyhood, is what he called it. And he talked about the different things he read. And, and books weren't always that accessible in rural Vermont. So he would take poetry anthologies that were kind of, you know, the people who owned them sort of intended them as decoration. This is something that's going to look good on my table. Uh, but that didn't matter to young Calvin. He would just read the books because he wanted to read anything he could. And so one book that was was widely available was the Bible. And even in other books that he found, that that sort of biblical influence was there at, at a removed degree. I think Franklin's autobiography was a big influence on Coolidge, not just because Coolidge himself would go on to write a great autobiography. It's not that well known today, but it certainly is still a, a wonderful book, but also because of Franklin's sort of aphoristic style. And, you know, Benjamin Franklin listened to preachers carefully. He published George Whitefield's um, sermons in America and was very influenced by that style as well. So this kind of aphoristic ability to deliver punchy summaries and memorable summaries that sort of made your point in a quick and concise way, that was something you could see in the, the most popular translations of the Bible and you could hear from the pulpits. Franklin heard it, Coolidge heard it, Coolidge listened to it, Coolidge read Franklin. It was everywhere and I definitely think it shaped Coolidge's style and, and is one reason his writing feels so all-American. We're chatting with Craig Fairman, author of Author in Chief. Craig, uh, Calvin Coolidge wrote all or almost all of his own speeches, right? Which is not the case with all presidents. That's right. He he became president at a really interesting time when we were sort of moving from the old model of, of presidents as kind of removed statesmen, you know, kind of the George Washington model to the FDR model where the president was surrounded by lots of, uh, you know, basically businessmen, consultant, political types. And so Coolidge worked with a ghostwriter who had started under Harding. Harding was the first person to employ a ghostwriter at the White House as, as a part of the permanent staff. And Coolidge kept him on. And, and I mean, frankly, when you're president, and especially when you're president in, a, in the kind of modern era that, that Coolidge was, you couldn't write everything yourself. But Coolidge still did do a lot. And the speeches that really mattered, the speeches that helped elevate him to the presidency, and then the autobiography he wrote after, that was... 100% him. He loved to sit there with a pencil and write and, and more importantly, revise. His wife, Grace, would tell wonderful stories about how he would spend time rewriting speeches over and over again. And, and I remember working at the library in Northampton and, and looking at the papers. And, and those revisions were almost always about making the speech more concise, more, more punchy. And he would work on it and, and seemed kind of glum. And, you know, I, I don't think this is any good, I, I, but I've made it the best I can. And then he would go out and give the speech. And then he would tell Grace afterwards and kind of this sort of, you know, confident, smiling way, I guess it was a pretty good speech after all. And that's that's any writer. If, if you're working on something, when you're working on it, you don't think it's any good. You don't think anyone's going to care. But over time, you revise and you try to make it as good as you can. can and, and sometimes when you're finished, you're like, well, that turned out pretty well after all. And that certainly was Coolidge as well. That was certainly my experience um, at a lower level of uh, government service. I could tell when I had a good speech and one that didn't really resonate. Sure. Craig, do you have a favorite Coolidge speech? I have to I have to admit I'm not very original on this on this front that my favorite is the, you know, what you called the have faith speech, the one that he gave in the Senate in 1914. Um it, I just think, you know, 
it was one of those speeches that he revised again and again because he knew that it was going to be a big moment as he stepped up in the in the Senate as the president of the Senate, and he knew that people were going to pay attention to it. And so he revised it over and over. It ended up being a very short speech. You know, people at the Capitol at that time noted this is one of the shortest speeches we've we've seen in this in this function, but it was also a really memorable one. It, it kind of marked him as a political star and we talked about the biblical influence. I, I think that you can hear in those lines that kind of homiletic King James Version style. It, it, parts of it feel like Proverbs. So one of my favorite passages, and it, it's a very famous one, but famous for a reason, Coolidge says, do the day's work. If it be to protect the rights of the weak, whoever, obje- whoever objects, do it. If it be to protect, or if it be to help a powerful co- corporation better to serve the people, whatever the opposition, do that. So you can see in the kind of parallel structure of those sentences, you can feel the classical influences that we talked about. But you can also feel in how concise it is, in how uh, simple it is, that that kind of biblical influence. And Coolidge could draw on both strains to produce really memorable speeches. And I I don't think there were any more memorable than that one in 1914. And that speech, Have Faith in Massachusetts, along with others, um, were compiled in a collection that became part of a campaign document, right? And um, and one one of the strengths of your book is uh, the story of how Coolidge got those speeches and others published, and and why. So tell us about that. Yeah, I I don't think it's it's it overstates things to say that Coolidge would not have become president without that book. Um, when he was running for president, he of course eventually became vice president, and then ascended to the presidency. But when he was running his campaign, the the, the book was his campaign, and his campaign was the book. Um, we, we need to talk about somebody else here, though, who's really important in pulling that together, and that was Frank Stearns. I mentioned that this was a time in American culture when, you know, business was becoming bigger, marketing was becoming bigger, public relations was sort of emerging. And Frank Stearns was somebody who was good at all of those areas. He was a, a powerful businessman in Boston. And once Coolidge delivered that speech in 1914, Stearns was one of those people who said, you know, this, this young senator is a future star. This is somebody that I want to work with. This is somebody who could be president someday. And Stearns believed that before anyone did probably before Coolidge himself did. And so it it started with that speech. Stearns would print out copies of the speech and mail it to various influential figures, both in Massachusetts and and around the country. Stearns actually took the time to mail it to to prominent pastors who would then use that speech as sort of the basis for their own sermons. And so Stearns knew that that Coolidge's words and, and the way Coolidge presented himself on the written page could be a powerful tool. And once Coolidge became governor and, and became, you know, began to develop the political uh, resume that, that could make somebody a serious contender for the presidency, um, they began working on a book. Now, in public, Coolidge said, you know, you guys can put the book together, but I don't want anything to do with it. In private, though, again, working at the Northampton Library, I found that Coolidge was pretty involved in the book behind the scenes. And and this is very consistent with what made Coolidge such an effective politician, that he could preserve this this, um, image. And I do think it was an authentic image. It wasn't artifice, but he could preserve this image of, you know, I'm a governor. I have a job. That's what I'm going to focus on, while also finding people like Stearns who could help push, uh, you know, his his larger ambitions behind the scenes. And so Coolidge would suggest, you know, this is how we should punctuate this book. Um, but he also let Stearns do a lot of the work. And Stearns did a lot of work. He found the right speeches. He put them in the right order. He worked with Houghton Mifflin, which was one of the most prominent publishers in America and conveniently located right there in Boston. So, you know, you had Coolidge in the, in the State House, you had Houghton Mifflin there, you had Stearns with his department store, all within a few blocks of each other. And they put together this book that became a, a, a popular book. It was reviewed everywhere. And it really, for a lot of people, was their introduction to Calvin Coolidge as a thinker and as a politician. Stearns was was essential in that. He sent it out to um, to delegates who would be at the presidential convention because, of course, that's how nominees were picked at that time. He sent it out to important journalists. He sent it all around the country. And the book was so popular that they they needed more copies quickly. Stearns used his business connections to secure paper for Houghton Mifflin when the publisher couldn't get them themselves. But that was the kind of uh, negotiator and marketer and connected person that, that Stearns was. And the book went everywhere. The, the person who ended up nominating Coolidge for vice president at, the, at that convention knew Coolidge because of his book. And, and he didn't just have one copy of Coolidge's book. He had multiple copies because Stearns was so thorough that he made sure to send other people, to send him multiple copies. Um, friends, this delegate's friends had copies and, and they all talked about Coolidge's book and they, they liked Coolidge as a person because they liked his speeches. So in a sense, you can see that between Stearns's, you know, sort of marketing savvy 
but also Coolidge spending the time over the years to really get those speeches right. And the, the Have Faith speech was the one that gave the collection its title and also was, you know, one of the essential documents in that in that book. Those two forces combined to really propel Coolidge onto the national stage and, and make him a, a very exciting political figure. Wow, it really had an impact. I, I happen to have a copy of um, of that volume that was passed down in our family from my great-grandfather who acquired it at the time it was published. So uh, as you say, everybody uh, was, was reading it. That's amazing. And it wouldn't surprise me if Stearns didn't have a hand in getting your great-grandfather a copy. That, that would make a lot of sense. Well, he was a municipal official in uh, mm-hmm. Western Massachusetts, so I bet you're right. Yep. Craig, um, uh, earlier in our chat, you referred to Coolidge's uh, um, moniker of Silent Cal. Um, as you note, he, he, read a, uh, he wrote a lot. He, he spoke a lot. Uh, he used radio uh, quite a lot, despite his nasal twang it was quite effectively. So why do you think his reputation is one of being silent Cal? Sure. Well, I think it gets back to what I said about Coolidge being so good at, at sort of using paradox to his own advantage. He, I mean, he was authentically silent Cal. He was not somebody who really enjoyed giving speeches or enjoyed dominating a room in, in a kind of political or, or personal setting. That was true to who he was. And, and people could sense that, that he was true to himself. And I think that's a big part for his appeal. But at the same time, he was very aware of how the world was changing, about how America was changing, how media was changing, especially how celebrity was changing. So he, you know, it was authentic that Calvin Coolidge liked to go back to his family home in Plymouth Notch and work on the farm. That's not something he did for cameras. That's something he did because it mattered to him and it it aligned with his values and he still cared about his family. But at the same time, he understood that there were going to be reporters there, and he understood that it would be helpful for him if he would put on his family's old farm clothes so they could get good pictures of him doing this thing that he authentically cared about. And he kind of had the best of both worlds. He could have this sort of, he could be an avatar for an older America while also taking advantage of the technologies of a new America. And, and it was really an example, I think, of the person and the moment being perfectly matched because America was changing so quickly that a lot of people could remember the older Plymouth Notch style America while they, most of them, lived in cities now and understood the newer America. And, and Coolidge could offer the best of both worlds. You could have the reassurance of somebody who reminded you of, of the way America used to be while that person was also very capable of using what America was today. And, and I think that showed up in his writing as well. Again, Seeing a president's writing is a great way to see that president as a person, to see what they care about, to see what they're good at. And so Coolidge understood that, you know, he was sort of taciturn and concise, but he was also someone who was a very talented writer. And a lot of that talent came from his revision, from his concision. The One of the passages from Franklin's autobiography that really mattered to him was when Franklin talked about rewriting poetry as prose and just taking the time to really work over language again and again. And so Coolidge could be, you know, had that that image of being quiet and, and concise, but he could also use those skills to produce really, really memorable writing. And when you're someone who doesn't speak a lot, when you do speak, it becomes all the more memorable. So Coolidge knew how to use kind of both sides of the same coin in, in many different areas of his political life. And I think that silent Cal image only made his writing more memorable and more effective. And of course, Plymouth Notch uh, is preserved by the state of Vermont to be as close as possible to what it was like a century ago. And um, gives me an opportunity to encourage all of our listeners to come for a visit when the uh, site is open from Memorial Day to Columbus Day. Well, Craig, uh, you are a great fan of Calvin Coolidge, as am I. Uh, you rank him very highly, perhaps at the top of presidential writers. Who else uh, stands out among the 44 other chief executives? Well, I think one thing that really fascinated me and excited me while I worked on my book, and I, and I spent 10 years working on it, is that a lot of the presidents that, that we're all excited about already were also really important writers. What, what, was the, what was fascinating is that the stories of them as writers hadn't always been told. There are examples of Coolidge, who you know maybe aren't the first names that come to mind when you think about great American presidents, but you can understand when you start doing the research that their writing was really important and that people at their own time saw them as really important. And you know anybody who visits Plymouth Notch, which is, is a great idea, should really read Coolidge's autobiography as well, because there are no better descriptions of what life was like there than, than from Coolidge himself. But other presidents who are sort of, you know, more at the front of the kind of collective consciousness, people like Lincoln, John Adams, they turned out to be really great writers, too. And in my book, I was able to find new stories, new letters, new details from so many presidents that that would surprise people, I think. 
Abraham Lincoln, um, when he ran for president, a book that he had put together was essential to him sort of coming from a, a very small political reputation to ultimately winning the White House. It, it's a parallel that actually is very close to Coolidge's in that a book of speeches really did a lot to help elevate and, and define Lincoln as a, as a national character. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't know Lincoln had written a book before I started working on my book, but the story of him writing the book, and even more, the behind the scenes glimpse of how much Lincoln cared, how Lincoln would worry about every comma and the order of speeches and who exactly the printer should be, that really tells you something about how Lincoln saw the world and, and how important books were to him in even thinking thoughts like, you know, I grew up on the frontier, but I could maybe be president someday. I can participate in these debates about slavery and its perpetuation or its end. Books helped Lincoln take that step. And he then, you know, understood that a book could help him um, become a, a more important participant in that. And so there are examples again and again, you know, political books sometimes are easy to roll our eyes at today. It sometimes seems that, that, that a political book, you know, the politician might sign off on it. But other than that, somebody else slaps the book together and it's just an excuse to get on TV and talk about yourself. And that's true of some books, although there are also some politicians um, who, who have written really important and useful books. But especially when you dig into the history, you see that these presidents cared so much about their writing and cared so much about putting themselves in their books. And, and if you look at them as writers, it's a new and really revealing way to understand them. And it goes back all the way to the beginning. John Adams actually wrote the first presidential memoir. You know, today we know George W. Bush has written one, Barack Obama has written one. It, it's one of those books that that is always going to be a bestseller. But it started with John Adams. So it started all the way back at the beginning. And, you know, John Adams, another New Englander like Coolidge, was thinking about Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and, and wrestling with those same ideas and those same those same constraints. Although I guess we can't say Adams was, nobody would ever call Adams silent John. <laughs> he was, he was much more verbose, but you can still see this tradition where, you know, Adams, Coolidge, Franklin, all the way up to, to Grant and presidents today, they've been connected by reading and writing and, and trying to define their legacies and, and debate their ideas. And, you know, that, that's a story that had never been told before. And I was really thrilled to be able to tell it in my book. Well, I hope others will have the chance to, to read it as I did. I want to thank you, Craig Fairman, for being on the this episode of The Coolidge Way. Again, uh, Craig's books are author-in-chief and the best presidential writing. And I think it's uh, an opportunity to have some lessons about uh, the leaders of our country that uh, that will resonate today. Thank you so much, Craig, for being with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. One of the things that strikes me, perhaps because I served so long in state politics, is that Coolidge was a gubernatorial president. By the time he got to Washington, Coolidge had experience running things and making compromises. He wasn't an untried ideologue. That made him more efficient as a lawmaker. For example, he wanted to get the top tax rate down to 25 percent. Well, Congress didn't want to go along with that. Progressives in the House wanted to get the rich and hike the rates. They wanted to embarrass the rich. So Coolidge made a key concession and one that hurt. He agreed to a provision in the law that took the tax bills of rich Americans and put the amount next to their name on the wall at the local post office. The Peeping Tom provision, as it was called, gave reporters plenty of fodder. But once Coolidge won his election in 1924, he had enough backing to repeal that ugly Peeping Tom item. We know you'd like to read more about Coolidge. That's why the Coolidge Foundation is pleased to remind you of the publication of a new edition of the President's Autobiography. This edition contains not only the President's text, but also a timeline and essays, including by members of the Coolidge family and yours truly. The Coolidge Way is a production of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation with offices in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, and Washington, D.C. Special thanks to Coolidge Living History performer Tracy Messer, who read some important quotes from our 30th president. If you have thoughts, questions, or comments on this episode or any other, please don't hesitate to send me a note at coolidgefoundation.org slash the Coolidge Way or on one of our social pages. Earlier in this episode, our Calvin Coolidge pop quiz asked you this question. 
When a president passes away as Coolidge's predecessor, Warren Harding, did, the vice president becomes president. How many times have vice presidents become president after a death in American history? The answer is eight. In 1841, 1853, 1865, 1881, 1901, 1923, 1945, and 1963. I'm former Vermont Governor Jim Douglas. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us for another episode of The Coolidge Way.